uh, President Jeremy Anderson and the uh, entire ECS team for, for the opportunity to, to be with you and for inviting me to be a part of this important discussion. In this session, we're here really to look ahead, to press into the future, to, to, to press ahead and to look into the future of higher education and look for ways in which we can prepare ourselves and our students for that future. Now, in a few minutes, Governor Sandoval will lead us in that discussion, and I'm very pleased that we'll be joined by the two people that uh, Governor Hickenlooper just talked about, for whom the talk is really more than just rhetoric, two individuals for whom the future really is now. Ashley is a recent college graduate, and Jeff, as the governor mentioned, is a high school teacher, and we're very much uh, um, in the center of, of the discussion. I, for one, am very interested in hearing uh, what they have to say, so I promise I won't uh, talk at you for very long this afternoon. Uh, I've been asked to uh, set the stage for the discussion, and I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity to do that. I think many of you are familiar with Lumina Foundation. For those of you who aren't, um, we are structured in a way where an ambitious goal really defines and drives all of the work that we do. At Lumina, we call it Goal 2025, and simply stated, we want 60% of Americans to hold high-quality post-secondary degrees, certificates, and other credentials by the year 2025. Increasing post-secondary attainment while ensuring the quality of the credentials for, that students earn, that's really our dual mission. And it's a mission that's being embraced by individuals and organizations and states throughout the nation for very good reason. It's vital to our economic future and really key to the strength of our democracy. Now, by now, I think that the case for increasing college attainment is well documented. And I want to be clear that I use the terms college and post-secondary interchangeably, referring to all forms of post-high school or post-secondary education, not just the shorthand four-year degree version. Economists and labor experts agree that in any city or region, the key factor in economic growth and job creation is the education level of its residents. Without access to a well-educated workforce, and in today's economy, that means a college-educated workforce, no business is likely to thrive or, frankly, even to survive. And the truth will be doubly true, I think, in the coming years. The single fact is two-thirds of all of the nation's jobs will require some form of post-secondary education by the end of this decade. That's a huge increase since the mid-1970s when only about a quarter of those jobs required any education beyond high school. Of course, the arguments in favor of increasing post-secondary attainment aren't limited to the economy or the job market. We all know that increasing college attainment also generates significant societal benefits, including greater civic and social engagement, higher rates of voter participation and volunteerism, healthier lifestyles, less dependence on public benefits, and the list goes on. These benefits have huge implications for the health and the vitality of our democracy. Finally, there's also an urgent societal need, really an equity imperative for achieving that goal, goal 2025. As all of you know, there are massive gaps in educational achievement in the country linked to race and class, persistent and pernicious inequities that have plagued us for decades. Just last week brought further evidence of these inequities when the Council on Foreign Relations released a new report on remedial education. The report shows that in the US, unlike virtually any other advanced country and uh, almost in defiance of logic, federal policy continues to be funneled to a disproportionate share of those who need it the least. As the Council's Rebecca Strauss said in a New York Times column that accompanied the report's release, at every point along the education track, from preschool to college, resources are skewed to wealthier students. Clearly, this serves to widen those attainment gaps, not narrow them, and that's a trend that our nation must reverse. We must increase attainment among those who've been traditionally underrepresented in higher education, including low-income and first-generation students, students of color, immigrants, and adults. We can't allow these attainment gaps to continue. 
The stakes are just too high, not merely for the people who are directly affected, but for every employer who needs skilled workers, for every citizen who stands to benefit from the economic and social progress that education brings. In short, for all of us as a nation. I know that many of you work hard every day to close those gaps. You know how life-changing education can be. You see it for what it truly is, an engine, one that powers the creation of better jobs, better lives, better communities and states. And yet, for that power to be fully unleashed, all of those parts really have to work together. The gears have to mesh. There must be smooth and seamless connections all along the way, from pre-K learning outcomes to K-12 standards to college admissions criteria to workforce readiness requirements and beyond. The learning and skills gained at each level must be transparently defined and clearly connected to the next. Put simply, we need a fully linked system for developing human capital. And the fact is, we are just not there yet. We need a redesign system, one that's flexible, affordable, and quality focused to properly serve the needs of students, of employers, and of society at large. Now, some progress is being made, of course, and we'll be talking about many of these points of progress right here at the forum over the next couple of days. David, just for example, highlighted, I think, some really interesting observations and trends about what college and career readiness actually means. In later sessions, we'll talk about the Common Core Standards and P20 data governance and proficiency-based systems for, pro for student progression. We'll explore new ways to boost success among non-traditional students and English, English language learners. All of these topics represents, represent pieces in that larger puzzle, puzzle I just mentioned, that seamless system of human capital development. All of us need to work together to actively visualize and help design this new system, one that's focused intently on the needs of students, today's students, those who, who, don't, those who don't necessarily fit that traditional definition. This redesigned system must deliver affordable, high-quality education to those who represent our future as a nation, those growing number of Americans who are low income, who are first generation, who are minority and who are adults. It must be a truly student-centered system, one that ensures access to all types of students, gives those students the support that they need, and enables them to earn credentials that demonstrate real and relevant learning. Now, I said at the outset of my remarks that we'd be uh, peering today into the future of higher education. Well, for me and my colleagues at Lumina Foundation, this student-centered, fully-linked system is the future, and more and more of our work is aimed at helping to build it. So what will that future look like? How will this new system actually work? There are many dimensions, of course, that need to be tackled, and we don't have time today to get into too many of the details, but let me just touch on two key issues. First, how that system is financed, and second, how we award credentials for those who successfully meet the academic requirements. First of all, the current student financial aid model, frankly, is broken. It's woefully outdated. How could it not be? It was designed to serve a traditional student population that looks almost nothing like the real world on today's campuses. We need a system in which resources are used to support and to incentivize the success of 21st century students, a much larger an infinitely more diverse population. The incentives in this new model must apply to students and to institutions. And most important, the entire focus of the system must shift 180 degrees. It must be redirected specifically to support the success of those low-income and, and disadvantaged students. In addition to redesign student finance, the second step in building a more student-centered higher education system is forging a new system of credentials. The current system is far too closed and rigid. It actually awards credits primarily not for learning, but for time spent in classrooms or labs. It's a system in which the recognized levels of achievement, the associate, 
the bachelor's, the master's degree, et cetera, are too few, they're too widely spaced, and they're too loosely connected. We need a new system of credentials to assure that high quality learning is recognized and rewarded no matter where or how that learning is obtained. It's hard to overstate the importance of this point when it comes to that redesigned higher education system. We must focus on learning outcomes as the true measure of educational quality. Not time, not status, not tradition, and certainly not reputation, but genuine learning. This shift to a learning-based approach is the key to creating the overarching system of education that runs from pre-K through higher education into the workforce and beyond. Once that shift is made, it becomes possible to take the other vital steps. For instance, we can align assessments and certifications at the various levels of education to prevent dupl duplication and improve timely completion of programs. We can clearly define career ladders and pathways for students to follow. Of course, for all of this to happen, what's needed, and David mentioned this point earlier, is alignment. Alignment of goals, alignment of data systems, alignment of standards and assessments. And as we prepare for this panel discussion that we're about to have this afternoon, I want to endorse one other type of alignment, the alignment of people. Our shared task, increasing student success and eliminating those attainment gaps, is a huge challenge. We cannot succeed if we stay in our silos. We all have to work together in preschool classrooms, in state house meeting rooms and governor's offices, in middle school math classes and high school counselor's offices, in community college faculty meetings and university lecture halls, wherever we work. Solutions must come from the front lines at all levels of the education system, and they need to be shared. And most important, they and we must remain focused on one thing, enabling many more students to reach the educational finish line of a high quality post-secondary degree or credential. And if I may, I'd like to take a moment to advocate for a particular subset of those frontline stakeholders whose expertise must inform efforts to redesign our post-secondary education system. I'm talking about the people who work every day directly with students. Classroom teachers, principals, teacher's aides, professors, adjunct faculty, teaching assistants, advisors, and others. As I've hopefully articulated today, change is occurring rapidly in the post-secondary space. And I believe the pace will only increase as the demands of a global economy compel the system to serve more students better. The reform train has left the station, and it would be a huge disservice to students if the voices of their teachers and professors were not heard. As conversations around these important topics in your states and regions continue, make sure that all of the right representatives have a hand in shaping what that future looks like. And so, let me conclude simply by saying I look forward to today's, to today's discussions and to your thoughts on how we can work together to build that brighter future. And now it's my privilege to invite uh, Governor Brian Sandoval, governor of the great state of Nevada, and chair of the Education Commission of the States, uh, as well as my fellow pa panelists, Ashley Carter, the recent college graduate from St. Louis University, and Jeffrey Charbonneau, the 2013 National Teacher of the Year, to join me here on stage. Let's begin. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Sandoval, governor of the great state of Nevada. It's really a privilege to be on the stage with all of you. I really appreciate your, your presentation. It was very thought-provoking. And I have a little bit of a selfish motive here. I have a son who's a, going to be a senior in high school. So I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, having this, this conversation with, you, with, with all of you. And uh, here with Jeff, who's the teacher, national teacher of the year from the great state of 
Washington, Ashley, who just graduated from St. Louis University uh, just a, a month ago, and congratulations originally from Milwaukee. <laughs> Now, Jamie, as I listened to your presentation, uh, a lot of thoughts crossed my mind. And one of the things that you talked about was breaking through this attainment gap. And I think it's something that everybody on this panel could perhaps offer because we have these wonderful conferences and we have education experts from across the country. But it's really what would be really interesting to me is to have a conversation of how the rubber hits the road when we you talk about these kids and this future that we're going to have where two thirds of the jobs will require post-secondary education. So as a, stu a student sits in the classroom, what is it that breaks through them and says, wow, I really need to, to go on to post-secondary education and, and start to do the things and, and be in Ashley's chair a few years from now. So why don't we start with you, Jamie? Yeah, you know, I think what's gonna motivate the students is, is two things. First is a clear understanding of what the outcomes are of their education. Those outcomes, I think we recognize increasingly have to do with the economic value of an education. Uh, I think people get intuitively, but probably not specifically enough, what the economic consequences are of not getting a, a, a post-secondary education of some type Though in some states, that is less true than others. In some states, the recognition of post-secondary credentials as the key to a middle-class way of life, to, to the opportunities that, that education brings to you personally and professionally, are still not increasing fast enough because a generation ago, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case for, for, for all people. Uh, that's one part. The, the other part, I think, in terms of, of motivating them is helping them understand that it's not just the economic outcomes that they get out of it, that they get a higher quality of life that comes from that post-secondary education. All of those things that David was talking about in ter terms of moving up that ladder, those, those higher levels of abilities that you have, they truly impact the quality of your life. They truly impact you know, the decisions you make about where you live, about how you're gonna raise your family, about the kinds of jobs you're gonna pursue, about the role you're gonna play in your community, et cetera. So all of those things, I think, are really important to help explain at an early enough, early enough point in the pipeline to our young people that this is what you get out of a post-secondary education. And then it's our responsibility to lay all of the track and to make all of the investments to help make sure they can be successful in that system. Thank you, Jamie. And I'll come over to you, <laughs> Ashley. And you, you've been, you're the one who's most recently there. What, you know, and you hear people talk about uh, the future and, and, and income and, and the differences in quality of life that you can have. And, and what was it for you that, that really talked to, or got that motivation going that, that J Jamie talked about? Well, I actually, I went to a high school that was a college prep school. So it did a really good job at telling us, you know, this is why college is important. This is why um, it's, it's something that you should do. Um, but I think that something that my high school could have done differently was actually telling me that I could do it. So I, I very much understood, oh, this is, this is, these are the things that, that it does. This is why I should go and get a higher education. This is why it's important. But I didn't understand the fact that I could do it. Um, and I, I felt like it was just something that was placed as this Thing that people did, a lot of people did, and it was good, but how, how did I know that I would be successful there? How did I know that it was a good thing for me? How did I know that I should go? Um, and it actually took for people to, to tell me, um, to tell me that this is something that you can do, this is something that um, you're actually capable of doing, and um, these are the resources that we can give you to make this happen. Um, and luckily I had a really good, um, a really motivated mom who was relentless in getting me into college because um, my senior year of high school, I actually didn't want to go because I just didn't think I could do it. Even though I had a um, really good you know, ACT score, I had a really good resume, you know, I had done a lot of volunteering, I had taken um, advanced placement courses, I had done all of those things that you know, help you get into college, but I just didn't feel like I was ready to go because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how I would pay for it. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know anything about college except for that it was a good thing. Um, and so I, I'm thankful that I had a mom who would do that. But I wish that you know, my, professor, my teachers in high school would have told me those things. Um, the same ones who were preparing me for college would have said, hey, you, you can actually do this, and this is why. These are the skills that you need. This is what you're learning. This is what you're doing. And we're going to help you get there in that kind of way. Um, so yeah. Well, it sounds like you were just overwhelmed. I mean, was there, 
a day or something where that light went on and you said, I can do this? Let's think. I think the day that, that it went on and said I could do this was actually maybe the day that I got my acceptance letter. Um, and I, when I actually got into the school and I said, well, well, maybe I am actually good enough to do this. Maybe I actually can um, be successful at this. And there were a whole bunch of other things that came after that with finances and all of those things. But um, I think it was having that, that letter in my hand that actually told me, you know, this is something that you can do. Um, this is something that you are capable of. This is something that we've been preparing you for and that you can, um, that you can be successful when you go. So. Did you have any friends that that didn't have that day like you? I did have a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends who, um, so in order to graduate from my high school, you had to either um, have an acceptance letter to college, you had to have a really good job, or you had to be going to the Army. Um, and that was just a requirement for us graduating. So I had a lot of friends who did not you know, get that acceptance letter, who didn't have that um, eye-opening or awakening moment of, of I can and I am capable of doing this. And they did choose um, to do other things, but I do think that they, that they would have been successful, um, that they could have gone. I, I have a lot of friends who actually didn't even apply to go um, to college because they settled for you know taking a job, which I guess isn't settling, but that they, they were capable, but they just didn't know that they were capable of doing it, and so they didn't even um, make the effort to, to try and go. Um, and so I... I, I know I, I know that it, that it's weird having you know just this acceptance letter be that you know thing, but I know that a, a lot of a lot of what helped me was also um, even helping me along in the process of applying. So I had a program that I was in called Urban Underground, and it was just this um, building in our neighborhood that we'd all go to. And one of their things was that they, they wanted to make sure that you were applying. They wanted to make sure that you were getting out there, that you were um, submitting, you know, submitting all the applications that you needed to in order for you to, to feel successful because they knew the impact that just having that letter would have. Um, but there weren't a lot of programs like that. You know, there was only one that I heard of you know, through my entire you know, high school you know, experience. And I didn't find out about it until senior year. So yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you. And Jeff, you're living this every day, and you've got those kids in, in your classroom. What are you seeing? What are you observing? Sure. You know, I think one of the big keys to it all is getting students the confidence that they can do it. You know, um, when I started teaching 12 years ago, I taught a very traditional, very basic uh, chemistry course. And my kids were bored. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't challenging them, as we were talking about earlier, in their minds. You know, they had seen protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many times do we teach that? And so there's two ways you can respond to that, two ways you can re respond to boredom. Oh, it must be too, too difficult, so I need to tone it down. Or you can say, well, maybe they need to be challenged more. So I threw more difficulty at them, and more difficulty, and more difficulty, and more difficulty. And eventually, I was teaching out of a college textbook, so much so that all of the classes that I now teach count for college credit. I'm an adjunct faculty member at three different universities. So every single student gets college credit that comes out of my classrooms. That does two things for me. One. It tells my students there's a relevance to their education. This means something. It's going to be useful for them later in life. And two, oh my goodness, I can do college. That's the idea. If we can give the students the confidence to go into post-secondary education, whatever that happens to be, then they're going to go. And, and I see that as, as the key. It's not about the content. It's not about the standards. It's not about all the rigor. It's about changing that perception in their minds that college is something for them. Now how about, uh, as you talk to your other faculty members, those students that aren't in your classroom and getting those college credits, how sure. are they connecting with those students? You know, it's, it's the same sort of thing. We're, we're making those personal relationships with, with, with students. We're trying to understand their backgrounds, understanding uh, their parents' family dynamic. You know, if a student comes into my classroom, or one of my other fellow teachers' classrooms, and says, Education is not for me. My parents don't want me to go on to college. As a teacher, it's going to be very difficult to argue with the, the power of mom and dad. Mm. Even though your children don't tell you that they're listening to you, they are. Okay? Even though the, you're going to deny that sometimes, you're going to think that your kids aren't listening to, to the values that you're trying to instill on them, they're listening to their parents. And so as an educator, I need to understand the family dynamic, not to fight against it not to change family perceptions, but instead to show how the family values can align with some sort of post-secondary education. 
So that's what the other teachers in my building are, are working towards. And in our school, we're doing pretty well at it. Even though we're 50% free and reduced lunch, we have a 98.6% graduation rate. 98.6% wow. graduation rate. It's been above 95 for five years straight. It's very impressive. Uh, Jamie, I don't know if you had any follow-up on what you just heard. No, you know, so much of this, uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that Ashley's experience is Jeff's experience, which is my experience. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all also first-generation college graduates. And so we also know from our own experiences what this, what this takes. Uh, this is not an abstract concept. We, we, we've, we've also lived it. And in my case, you know, the things that Jeff was talking about really, really ring true, which is that um, I, had, I had a family, or an immigrant family. Uh, my parents had no idea what college was. The only thing they knew was that we were going. Uh, that was the one, and they literally, my mother literally worked until the very end, until she passed away, to help support us to go to college. Um, that was, that was her, her sort of, of life mission. Um, I had um, uh, the great support of government, which is worth mentioning because my community supported me. I'm a walking advertisement for every financial aid program known to mankind. <laughs> Pell Grants, student loans, state support, local support, my church, my community-based scholarship foundation, you name it, I got it. And the third thing was an incredibly rigorous a supportive academic environment in high school that encouraged me to go. I happened to uh, uh, win the lottery and be taught by a national teacher of the year, my junior year in high school, and uh, who had the astonishing expectation of us that we would write a paper uh, in excess of 100 pages as juniors in high school. When I got to college and my friends were lamenting these 20 and 25 page little papers, I thought it was a joke. You know, I, I had been through a very rigorous experience but an environment that was very supportive. And, and I think that that was a long time ago, but I think that those things hold true, but just on a magnified scale now, because the importance of having a lot more people get high quality uh, post-secondary credentials through rigorous uh, high school and, and uh, elementary school curriculum uh, as the pathway forward, I think is absolutely essential. And so you know, I think our experiences are probably reflective of where we need to be going in terms of, of the experience of, of millions of people in this country. Thank you. Ashley, I'll go, I'll go back to, to you. And so while maybe this wasn't um, stated, but Ashley is a double major in criminal justice and psychology and dean's list. So very impressive uh, academic credential. <laughs> But another thing that uh, Jamie talked about, and I think you used the words real and relevant <laughs> education, and as you sat in the classroom in high school, what, what was, you know, you had different types of teachers. What did you perceive as the more effective teacher that you felt was really the one, some of the ones that were motivating you to go on to post-secondary education? <laughs> Um, well, it's interesting because my, the, the teacher that challenged me the most is the one that in high school I, I hated the most, and I love her now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in high school, I actually, I actually entered college as a biology major, and biology was my, it was the most challenging class that I ever took in high school. It was so hard, and I actually took this teacher for regular bio, well, for honors bio, but then also for advanced placement bio. So. Um, I took it for to, to earn college credit. And she was so challenging. I mean, she, she had this phrase that if you weren't dead, you needed to be in the classroom. <laughs> so, um, that, and that set the atmosphere for everything. So she was my most challenging professor, but I look back and it, it, it what, it's what prepared me the most um, because I, I learned what it was to write a, a lab report, what it was to get failing grades sometimes in her class. And um, it prepared me really well to, to not only see college as this place where, oh, I just have to only be successful all the time and I can't make any mistakes, but to be realistic and say, hey, it's a place where you make mistakes, but it's a place where you learn, and a place where you learn to, to learn, and you learn to get better, and you, you grow. And um, I'm really thankful for the way that she, that she did prepare me, for the way that she challenged us, for um, how difficult her class was, because I, I think it prepared me the most. Um, in it, I didn't enjoy it so much, but um, it, was, it was really good. It was one of the best experiences that I could have had, and it prepared me the most. Um, and I can honestly say that her class was maybe the only one um, 
maybe chemistry as well sometimes, but um, it was the only one that, that challenged me in that kind of way. Um, my other classes, I didn't really have to study very much. I, um, you know, could ace the test and I knew it, but in that class, um, she, she challenged us in a different kind of way and she held us to a, to a higher standard um, and it really helped to prepare, to prepare me. So. Thank you, Ashley. Now, Jeff, you've got a new expression. If you're not dead, you should be in the classroom. <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. I like it. Yeah. I like it. So do you have any follow-up with that as well from your personal experience and what you observe at your high school? Sure. You know, I, I think the, as students are looking on to, towards that post-secondary education and they're trying to figure out what it is that they want to do in their lives, they, they need to keep one thing kind of uh, in their hearts and in their minds, and that is the job that they're going to do or the career field that they're going to go into is something that they need to love. And if we can foster that um, excitement for that career field for a student, then we're going to be doing our jobs as educators. And, and I say that because so often we look at our students and we try to be their friends, right? And maybe being the friend to a student isn't the best thing. I'm thinking back in the back of my mind, I wonder how many of my students hated me, so maybe that's a good thing now, I don't know. And if we can, if we can switch that up a little bit and make sure that as we're you know, pushing these students forward in chemistry or pushing them forward in advanced biology, we're also showing them the plethora of job opportunities that are out there. Then they're gonna be able to find something that they love. But let's also be just as excited about the student who uh, becomes a pharmacist one day as we are about the student who becomes a beautician someday because that's what they wanted to do. See, for me, sometimes we, we focus so much on attainment and the, the four-year degree as the be-all and end-all, and we're not succeeding unless we hit that. We focus on that so much. But some folks really want the AA, and they want to go be a, a, a radiology uh, technician and that's what they want, and that's their passion. So we need to be um, open to that level of success for students and really foster that for them. Now you mentioned you have a 98% graduation mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to some of those schools that could only dream of having a high school graduation sure. rate like that? It's one-on-one -on -one contact. Uh, we have a career and guidance counselor. That's all they do is career and guidance, not at-risk counseling. We have a separate at-risk counselor for that. We have a career and guidance counselor for our 400 student high school who meets with every single student two to three times every single year. But on top of that, we're a small school, so you can't hide from us. You know, the teachers know every single student by at least face, if not by name, irregardless of whether or not they're in classes or not. Having that close personal relationship with students allows you to really make that connection, to understand what the students' uh, motivations are, what drives them, whether it's sports or other activities. And if you can get that relationship going, then you can motivate them in other ways to go on to pursue something. So the, the better you can increase that one-on-one -on -one time with students, the better off you're gonna be. Uh, Jamie, uh, one of the things you mentioned your, in your presentation was diversity in the classroom. Classrooms don't look today like they did 20 right. years ago. And how does, what are your feelings on that and with the discussion that we've had? Today. Yeah, you know, I think um, the, the conversation about uh, educational diversity uh, on, uh, and the Supreme Court um, uh, decision, which uh, essentially just sort of kicks the can down the road to try to figure out what we're going to do about the use of racial preferences in college admissions is an example of this, which is that we're still confused as a country about how to deal comfortably with issues of race and class. Uh, my own view is that uh, there may have been a time in our history when this was about somebody else. This is no longer about somebody else. This is about us. This is our collective future, our collective well-being. And so thinking about how we address that in the classroom, address that in our college and universities, address that in our schools, I think is really important. It has to do with pedagogy. It has to do with the support systems we put in place. It has to do with, with, with so many things. Um, this is a part of, of, of who we are as a country, as states, as, as communities. And if you think about uh, the outcomes that you get from diverse communities, great research that's done now about cities and metropolitan areas and the benefits that come culturally, economically, socially from diverse communities, those same kinds of things are true in our classrooms. And I think we need to do a much better job of embracing it rather than saying we've got to shift from the paradigm I know 
to a paradigm I don't know. The point is, this is what we should be doing because this is about all of us. Yeah, Ashley talked about her mom being a, a major motivator in her life and, and moving on. Talk about um, those households that are single parent households or perhaps both parents are working or there are no parents in the household. Yeah, you know, this is, uh, this is the, increasingly the norm. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about the, um, the structures that we have in place in our schools where we assume a two-parent family, we assume a stable family structure, we assume uh, adequate resources to feed children, to, to, to provide for daycare, things like that. We, we know that those things don't exist in too many of, of, of our communities. So, so again, that's part of the change in the structure in terms of the systems that serve the students, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. And there are lots of examples of wonderful organizations uh, that, are, that are working with, uh, with people in that way, but probably not enough on scale. I think that part of what we need to do in philanthropy and what I think uh, uh, the, the private sector and government need to work on together is to figure out how to take the best of those models to scale, work together actually in a collaborative public-private partnership, and try to address some of those, um, those pernicious uh, problems that, that, that we have. Um, I think um, failing to do so will have real consequences for us as a country. And Jeff, I see you nodding your head. Do you have some comments? Yeah. You know, it, the perception out there is that we have perfect families or we have completely dysfunctional families, whatever that means. But the reality is, is we're on a very wide spectrum of everything in between that is really hard to define. And so solutions that are set for one group of students just simply are not gonna work for all. You know, we, we have to be open to a flexible system that takes into the needs and accounts of each of our, our kids because that's what it's about. You know, the most important student is every single one of them. And if we keep in mind that while we're setting up these systems and policies and, and putting into these, these procedures into place, there has to be flexibility within that. And if we don't have some sort of flexibility for those students to take alternate paths or to earn credits maybe without the seat time, as you were alluded to earlier, then we're going to set up a system that simply doesn't work. Ashley, you've had a, an amazing academic career, and now you've just graduated from, from college. If we had a room full of high school seniors here, <laughs> what would your advice be to them? Yeah. Mm. A tough one. <laughs> um, I think the first thing that I would tell them is that um, no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, no matter um, how well you did in high school, no matter how well you did on the ACT or how bad you did or the SAT, um, that you're capable. Um, you are, you're more than capable of doing this and there are resources and there are people who um, have had your experience or who haven't had your experience who need to learn and who need to grow and who need to, to help you along and who are there um, to help you along. Um, I think I would al also tell them that that um, teacher that they hate the most, um, to remember to look to them to the best lessons that they could learn for college. Um, because I, you know, that, that's kind of how my experience was. Um, and then also that college isn't an easy road. It wasn't um, an easy experience, but it was more than worth it. I would do it over again all the same if I could um, because it's, it's worth it. And it teaches you not only about the books, not only about your career, but it teaches you about yourself. You learn and you grow and you um, experience and you, you realize what it is to, to actually um, have a glimpse of what it is to be out in the world. And, um, it's, it's a good thing, and it's, it's a, a doable thing. Um, if I can do it, anyone can do it, so, um, yeah. Now, when you uh, landed in, in St. Louis, coming from Milwaukee, mm -hmm. um, was there something after having had the benefit of a year of college that you wish you had gotten in high school? I think that I, w I wish I would have been more, um, uh, we were just talking about a little bit about the diversity and the, the shock that it was that it can't be culturally. And I think that um, actually my first year being at SLU, um, I did not want to come back to SLU. I really wanted to transfer somewhere else, but I didn't have, I didn't think that it would actually be different. Um, and it's because there was a cultural shock. The neighborhood, the school where I came from, we all looked the same. We all were the same. We all were pretty much the same. 
Um, and then I come six hours away from home, and it was a huge culture shock because I was a minority, which may not be a surprise to you guys, but to me, it was a huge shock. You know, it was a shock. I, I, you know, coming from a school where everyone else is like you and you go to this place where, you know, there is a handful of people who are like you, it's, it's very, it's difficult. Um, and, and then also, it wasn't only that, but it was a socioeconomic shock. And I can remember one conversation that I had my freshman year when in my first week that I was at SLU and um, I told people that I was from the city and they were so shocked by that. I was like, I'm from the city of Milwaukee and they're like, oh, like, you're from the city? And I said, yeah, from the city. <laughs> and to them it was a huge deal and I didn't understand you know, why that was such a big deal, but it was just, um, it was different, it was a shock. And so I wish that maybe um, I would have been a little bit more prepared for that because it, it hinged and it, it made me not want to go and seek out the, the help that I actually needed in transitioning that first, you know, my first year. I didn't want to seek out help because I didn't want people to think, oh, she just needs help because she's, you know, this black girl from the city. And I, I didn't want people to think that I couldn't be successful just because of the way that I looked or because of, you know, where I came from. And so I didn't want to seek out help because of that. And so I wish that I would have been a little bit more prepared for, um, you know, the, the, I, I wish I would have had the diversity training that I got once I was in, you know, college. And just seeing that everyone's different and everyone struggles different and just because I look the way that I am, it doesn't mean anything about me, it doesn't say anything, it just um, adds a little character to who I am. Or, um, you know, I, I just, I wish it would have been something like that prior to coming to, to a little, ease the transition a little bit more um, in having that, so. Thank you. Now, Jeff, do you um, talk to some of your proud graduates uh, from your classes and your schools and they come back to you and do they give you some of the feedback that Ashley just described? Oh, absolutely. You know, we're, uh, we're in a very small rural agricultural community. So when my kids go to the big city, they get their own <laughs> dose of, of reality too. And, and so there is that culture shock, you know, but there's a couple of different culture shocks there. There's the, the social, there's the uh, economic, um, but then there's just the, the study habits and the other academic so you know, shock as well, I think you can agree with. And I think the one thing that we can really do to help uh, benefit all of our students is to um, have some sort of a, a transitional training, you know, at, at all levels, whether that's transition from middle schools to high schools, high schools to colleges, because it's in the transitions that I think that we lose a lot of our students. And if, if we can help bridge that gap, we're gonna be a little bit better off. So just like many universities have maybe a University 100 class, you know, to help with the transition, maybe we need to have a, a high school end of high school transition class, you know, to kind of give them and prepare them for some of those uh, issues that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Jamie, you've got a, a national perspective. Have you seen any school districts or, or universities doing those types of things to, to help students like Ashley and, and the students from Zilla High? You know, there are pockets of excellence uh, all over and uh, the, you know, we see these, these examples uh, in communities where, and here's part of the, I think the key to success is when you have a broad community involvement trying to solve the problems, that you bring the business leaders, the civic and community leaders, and the education leaders together. You set out to, you set some goals as a community, and you work together to try to achieve those goals. And there are lots of examples. Um, Louisville's on a path to do this, for example. M many others that, that, that we can talk about, where you can see these kind of things starting to take shape. But the key is that, and I mentioned this in my remarks, that collaborative perspective. This is not the educator's problem. This is not the problem for teachers to fix. This is not the problem for, for our colleges and universities to address. This is our shared problem, but also our shared opportunity that comes from what we get out of, uh, get out of the, this system. You know, I just sitting here thinking about, about this conversation and the important things that that um, have both Ashley and Jeff bring to this conversation, you know, really what, what this is all about fundamentally for us as a society is talent. That's what we need as a society is a lot more talent. Talent's been part of what's driven us as a country historically. Actually, two things have driven us, talent and scale. We've had a lot of talent and we've had a lot of people that have helped to drive our, our industry, our economy, our culture, our social uh, cohesion. Well, now we don't have scale so much anymore, not with India and China and other places. So being able to invest in talent and to get the outcome that, get, that we get from that talent, which 
I believe has to be increasingly gained in post-secondary learning environments. That's the key, that's the key to the strength of our communities, that's the key to the success of our states and ultimately to our country. It's investing in the talent and getting the outcomes that get from people who are better educated and can actually apply those educational skills, demonstrating the competencies that David was talking about earlier to have a better life for themselves and ultimately contribute to our collective well-being. That's really what this is fundamentally all about. Thank you, Jamie, and I could keep asking questions, but I wanted to offer an opportunity to anybody in the audience who wanted to ask questions of, of the panelists. Uh, is there anybody out there who wanted to ask a question over here? Good afternoon, my name, <clears throat> excuse me, good afternoon, my name is Stephen Lampkin. I have a two-part question uh, for Ashley Carter and other panelists. You mentioned Urban Underground was a resource that really helped you. What other programs and resources have been key uh, to your progress? And then secondly, there's been talk about privileged resources and privileged knowledge. And Mr. Marisotis mentioned that these resources tend to be skewed to those who already have the privilege. And I'm wondering as you're going forward, what resources might be helpful for you to attain your next goals and dreams? Um, so um, Urban Underground was a program that um, assisted me a lot during high school, but there have also been programs in um, my college career that have helped me um, to transition so, so much, I can't even say. Um, the first one was actually the, the class that every freshman was required to take, and it was a transitional class to transition into the university. Um, and I love this class so much that I actually taught it for the next three years that I was at the university, just because I wanted to be able to structure it even more for people who I know may have been struggling um, through this transition. And because I kind of lived through the experience, I wanted to, to make sure that I used that to, to help other students transition. There are also programs that have helped, such as the Student Support Services Program um, at St. Louis University, and that's basically a program geared toward um, making sure that first-generation students are, um, are being successful at the university. Um, the, the struggle that I had with um, Student Support Services in the beginning was that um, sometimes getting help has such a bad, such a negative connotation at the university. Um, but I think in getting over that and in pushing through that, I also ended up being a mentor for other students who were coming through this program. Um, and so I think that that in itself, not only having um, uh, faculty, um, but also other students who were pouring into me and telling me that I could be successful at the university and assisting in that transition, but also just having, um, having that structured program um, so they're telling you step by step what it is that you can do. They're giving you these resources. They're assisting you financially. And um, it was something that really greatly contributed to my success. And um, it was something that even in my senior year, my junior year, that I definitely um, gave back to myself just to make sure that other students could have that same experience. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah. Was there a question? Did you have a question for Jamie as well? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, right now I am working at a place called the Crime Victim Advocacy Center, but before um, working at this place, I actually was considering going to grad school, and a, a program that uh, is sadly now, um, it's no longer at SLU, but it was a program that, that helped me, you know, uh, go toward, move toward going to graduate school. It's called the McNair Scholars Program. Um, and it's geared toward making sure that you're doing research, helping you get into graduate school, and um, it helped me so much um, to get into graduate school um, a lot, but uh, funding with school um, was a little weird, and, and actually at the end of my senior year, they removed the program, so it made it more difficult to get that funding. So having programs like that that help people, um, that help students to look forward and see um, what goals are next, what things that they can do next are, um, a beautiful thing, and I still do plan to go to graduate school next year, so um, it's still something that's on the table, but um, it, it's sad to see that, that no one will get to experience that McNair program, but having things like that um, will, would, really did assist in, in the way that I thought about my future, so. Any other questions? I see a hand over here.
Thank you. Kate Sullivan, State Senator from Nebraska. Uh, I guess my comment and question can be responded to by all of you uh, because I think it impacts all levels. And that is in this country, the growing disparity of income between those who have and those who have not. And how that impacts not only individual choices that a student can make, but it impa the impact on families and the cost of, high of education. And, and then just simply uh, the, the workforce of tomorrow. And uh, so I'd like some comments from all of you on that issue. Thank you. Amy? So the economist Tony Carnavali uses this wonderful line that I like all the time, which is he, he says, the best umbrella in an economic storm is a college education. Um, what he means by that is that absent a post-secondary credential that has real learning, real meaning behind it, your chances of being in the middle class are diminishing very rapidly in our society. So um, the income disparity is overwhelmingly linked to the, the talent that we have in our society, and that talent is measured by whether or not you've gotten a high quality education all the way through the pipeline to whatever the end point is, as Jeff pointed out earlier, whether it's a certificate or an associate degree or a bachelor's degree, but that's what's so critically important. So I think we get caught up in these sort of policy discussions. I spent most of my career in public policy before philanthropy uh, trying, to, trying to address uh, symptoms of the problem rather than getting at the root. And the root, in my view, is overwhelmingly the talent that we have as a society. Investing in that talent leads to greater productivity, leads to greater outcomes, leads to higher income for the people who, who have that talent. Uh, the evidence is pretty clear. Yeah. yeah, and I think we just need to recognize you know, the, the economic changes that have happened. In the 12 years that I've taught at Zilla High School, when I started there, uh, we were about 27% free and reduced lunch. We're up in over 50% now district-wide in just 12 years. It's a very changing landscape that's out there. And as the students change, the way that we teach them needs to change. The way that we uh, help them in the, the transitions to colleges need to change. You know, it was very true many years ago that you could work all summer long and make enough money to pay for tuition. You can't do that now. You, you'd have to work full time year round to pay for, you know, not, not even an entire year's worth of tuition. You know, and, and that's if you don't spend any of your own money. So the concept that so many people that I hear of out there, oh, well, I worked my way through college. You can't work your way through college anymore unless you have a college degree, which you don't have because you haven't gone. To... So it just doesn't work. We need to come up with something different. Right, I see we're close to or out of being out of time. Are there any um, closing comments you'd like to share with everybody, Ashley? I think in closing, I just I, I think um, what's ha what has helped me um, throughout college is is just um, an emphasis on programming. So we talk about these things like economic issues, these uh, di diversity issues, those types of things. And I think the thing that we need to realize is that it's it's not something that is just a a bubble out there that we can't pop and get into and, and explore. But it's actually something that we can, can fix. With the, we, we take these things into consideration and, and that we use um, all of these different things that we've talked about to build programming, um, to be assisting students, and to be letting students that they can that know that they can be successful and they do have resources in order to be successful. Um, and, and those were the things that helped me the most. Um, they were the things that helped a lot of my friends through college the most. And so I think that those are the things that are most beneficial for the students. It's having those programs geared towards these issues that we can all see um, and diving into it and changing them. And even if we make mistakes along the way, knowing that those bumps in the road will, will eventually lead to something better. Um, so yeah. Just a, a couple of actionable things. You know, what can we do to help solve this problem? Uh, I, I think there's, there's, there's several that you can do and some that are very low cost. First, how simple would it be to set up a website to have a single common application for college? That we don't, students don't have to navigate 17 different applications, 17 different essays, and all of the rest. What if we could get our colleges and our universities and our trade schools to come together with a single common application? I know that happens in some places. We could expand that type of a program. Very low cost thing. Second, expanding a college and the high school uh, program within, within your states. It does several different things. It saves the, the student money and time. It gives them the confidence and the abilities that they can and will succeed uh, in college and universities. And it also gives teachers within the K-12 system a little bit of a career arc, you know, to, to go in and, and have something else to strive for, to become a, an adjunct faculty member. And then third and the last uh, actionable item I, I'd like to ask you to involve in 
is that I have 40 of some of my best friends uh, sitting in this room, and that's the state teachers of the year that are here. And they are absolute experts in their field. Please find them during this conference and, and bend their ears just a little bit because they really do know their stuff. These are some people that really are the real deal, and it'd be awesome uh, for you to connect with them. Thank you. Jamie? Yeah, my final comment is simply, you know, from the post-secondary perspective that um, we need to design and build a 21st century higher education system, one that's flexible, one that's affordable, one that's focused on quality. We can't nibble at the edges. We can't be content with simply trying to achieve incremental change when the country has such a dramatic need for a lot more talent. That's going to require some really important fundamental choices and changes in the system. Changes in how we finance the system, changes in how we deliver education, and as I mentioned in my remarks, changes in how we recognize learning through the awarding of credentials. But we need a real sense of urgency around this. This is not the kind of conversation at the post-secondary level that we can start now and like the conversation about K-12 education, which began in 1983, see how we're doing 30 years later, we've got a lot shorter time period for us to be able to achieve the outcomes that we need for our economic and social uh, future as a country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd please join me in thanking this incredible panel today. Thank you. Great job.